get started. So, um, as I said, the uh, Congress has now passed, the Senate and, um, and uh, the House. I think I read 24 Republicans voted for this in the Senate. So uh, this is a bipartisan bill. Um, beware, always beware of bipartisan bills. Uh, you know, when, whenever the Democrats and Republicans actually agree on something, it's probably bad. It's probably not good for the country. It's probably not good for you. And this is a good example of that. Um, it, this is a pretty good example of that. And we will, we'll, we'll, you know, where both Republicans and Democrats have agreed. And of course, they agree because there is a national security threat. And uh, of course, you can't argue with a national security threat. The, status, the national security threat is the fact that chips, uh, uh, microprocessors, computer chips, uh, are really, really important for everything, but particularly really, really important for uh, the Defense Department. Um, all sophisticated weapons today, all weapon systems today anyway, from drones to tanks to airplanes, to the computers, to, to everything. Everything the military does today depends on chips, and, and some of the stuff depends on some of the most advanced chips in the world. Uh, and uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, much of the chip manufacturing uh, has moved to uh, places like Taiwan and uh, South Korea. And much of the innovation in chips, much of the uh, you know, breakthroughs technologically in chips that used to be uh, what the United States, uh, particularly Intel, was, was, was really good at. Uh, today, the, the Taiwanese and, and the Koreans are, are pushing the envelope, and we are lagging behind them. And the challenge is, uh, how, do we, how do we keep a, a, a fresh supply of chips for the State Department, for the Defense Department, to make sure that our weapon systems have the latest and best and greatest chips Possible now. I have, I have, um, I've got a, I've got, I've got a solution for that. But what is? Let's just talk about what is the national security threat. Well, the way it's phrased, there are two aspects to the national security threat. The first is supply chains. Um, you know, while Taiwan and South Korea are friendly countries, their allies. Uh, it's difficult to get the chips over here. You have to fly them. You have to bring them by boat. There are bottlenecks. There are difficulties. One of those countries could have, I don't know, a pandemic or something. They'd lock it down, and then manufacturing in that country would slow down. Although, of course, um, Taiwan was never locked down. Uh, South Korea was never really locked down. It's America that was locked down. Actually, they did really well. Comparatively speaking, Taiwan did phenomenally well, comparatively speaking, with the latest pandemic. We're the ones who screwed it up. Uh, Todd, thank you. $100. Todd says, chips. I've owned Intel since early 2009, but this is stupid. And I don't know, you, you're probably not doing too well with Intel these days. They just reported pretty bleak earnings again. So, uh, um Intel not doing well the last few years. Although this bill will do very, it'll be really good for Intel. We'll get to that as well. Um, so supply chain uh, issues, you know, how do we get the chips? There have been chip shortages, although I don't know that those shortages have affected the Pentagon. Uh, those shortages were market shortages that resulted from shipping constraints and, and uh, disruptions to the global supply chain. So even though the Korean and the Taiwanese economies did not shut down. Much of what they, you know, chips are, are not made whole in those places. They get materials from elsewhere. Um, the whole supply chain kind of was broken and everything slowed down. Um, I don't know that the Pentagon was, was hurt by that. Maybe the Pentagon has priority. Maybe they get the first chips. Maybe they fly them in. Uh, you know, especially, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But that's one of the excuses given. We need, 
We need the chip manufacturers to be right here in the United States, and they should be American. We can't trust those Taiwanese and the Koreans. They should be American, and they should be here in the United States, and therefore, we won't have these supply chain bottlenecks. So that the Pentagon, the story goes, will get its chips just like that. Again, no proof, no suggestions uh, that the Pentagon is having a hard time sourcing chips right now. The second um, issue that people have raised, uh, the second issue that people, um, uh, you know, mentioned, uh, and, and this one is even, they're more adamant around, they're more inspired by, they're more motivated by, is the fact that, well, it's not a fact, is one word. You just say this one word and people quiver, people shake, people are, are, are just, just overcome with fear and apprehension. And that word is China. You just say China and everybody goes, whoa, China, China's subsidizing its chip industry. China's pouring billions of dollars into its chip industry. China is going to dominate the chip industry. China is, and of course, China could invade Taiwan and conquer Taiwan and take the chip industry from the Taiwanese. China. <sighs> now, yes, China is pouring billions of dollars into a semiconductor industry. China is, uh, as a top strategic priority for the Chinese central planners, is domination of the chip industry. Guess how successful they are? Not very. China has a very small percentage of the worldwide chip manufacturing industry. Um, it, 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 it is not anywhere near cutting edge. It is anywhere uh, from five to 10 years behind the Taiwanese, the Koreans, and even Intel, which is a couple of years behind the Taiwanese and the Koreans. So, China is not a threat. The more centrally planned Chinese semiconductor industry becomes, the less of a threat it is. Again, this understanding of what generates innovation, what generates ingenuity, what generates progress, what generates wealth, freedom, respect for reason, respect for individual innovators. When you see that lacking, lacking in a culture, when you see that lacking in a country, you're not going to get innovation there. You're not going to get massive progress. Now, yes, the Chinese can steal. Well, but they haven't been successful in stealing the semiconductor stuff because, again, they're at least five years behind. Five years is a long time in semiconductors, in tech generally. Five years behind, remember? version of the iPhone five years ago. Um, so what are we afraid of? We have this belief. It's ingrained in our politics. It's ingrained in our politicians. And unfortunately, most people in America and in the world believe it, that central planning is better than leaving the market alone. The, you know, I. I if the markets are left alone, how will we get the right chip? How will it be the right size? How will we get the right technology? I mean, isn't it better if, if we get somebody really, really, really smart and they figure it out and they subsidize all the best people and they invest in all the smartest guys and then we get the best deal because somebody thought about it and figured it out and, and, and mapped it all out? No, it turns out that's not how it works. Maybe the Alzheimer research is, is, a point in, is a point in case. Case in point, not point in case, case in point. The whole beauty of the market is that private entrepreneurs go out there and they try and they test, they fail, and they try again. The whole idea is venture capitalists Invest in some and don't invest in others and try and invest in the best. And if you look at a company like Intel, which is not doing well, and yet Intel is investing $23 billion in R&D next year. 
And this bill, by the way, is going to subsidize the semiconductor industry by about $50 billion over the next uh, few years, five years maybe. And um, Intel is probably going to get half of that. So Intel is already investing $23 billion a year of its owner's money, of its shareholder's money, in trying to figure this out. Now the government's going to give them more, which means Intel, if it had failed, maybe should go out of business so the capital can be allocated to some new entrepreneur who is going to make better chips than Intel. But now, with the government giving the half of the $50 billion that they're going to subsidize the chip industry with to Intel, guess what's going to happen? Intel can't fail. Intel is now secure. Intel doesn't have to worry about failure. Indeed, I would say the energy, the incentive, the passion about going out there and solving the problem is reduced because they're not under that big of a deal threat because the government's bailing them out. Markets are, are, are truly amazing things. Yes, failure happens. Now, let's say you are the Defense Department, the Pentagon, and you're worried about chip supplies for, for, for national security, real national security. I'm not talking about Trump's national security where the auto industry was deemed strategic for national security. I mean, I think, personally, I am convinced that the Iran book show is you know, fundamental and essential for the American national security, actually for global national security. I mean, every government in the world should be sending me money uh, because I'm crucial for their national security, except the Russians maybe and the Chinese but, uh, and the South Koreans and, no, I mean, the North Koreans and the Iranians and the Saudis. Well, all the good countries should be sending me money because I think my show is crucial for national security. I mean, give me a break. So, but there is national security issues. So what could the Pentagon do? Now, the Pentagon's a big buyer of chips. It could, for example, say, okay, we'll buy from you, uh, you know, Taiwanese company, or we'll buy from you, South Korean company, but we want all the chips made for us to be actually manufactured in the United States. We want you to manufacture them here because we're worried about supply chain, we're worried about what happens if there's a war between... North and South Korea, between China and Taiwan. We want the actual manufacturing facility in the United States. That is it. It's all you need. You don't need it to be America-owned. You just need to be in the United States. And you don't need to subsidize that. You're already paying for the chips. You're already a huge customer. Why wouldn't they just do it? So the whole national security issue is a bogus issue. It always is. 99.9% it, it, .9 of the time, when national security concerns are raised around you know, central planning issues, whether it's trade, subsidies, tariffs, uh, uh, you know, picking winners and losers, which is what the government is going to do now with chips. It is bogus. You know, funnily enough, we tried to do this in the 1980s. The Reagan administration was worried that American superiority in chip manufacturing was in decline because of the Japanese. I don't know how many of you around were back then, but don't you remember the days where Japan was going to take over the world? Japan was the biggest strategic threat to the United States. Japan was going to become the richest, biggest economy in the world. The United States was in massive decline, and it was all about Japan. So the Reagan administration designed a whole series of I, you know, uh, um, uh, God, limitations on the quantities that came in, tariffs, uh, all kinds of restrictions, including subsidies and, and restrictions and everything. And what happened as a result of the United States government intervening in the marketplace on chips? Shockingly, 
Japan became more dominant in chip manufacturing, the United States started a long decline in chip manufacturing. Japan ultimately was not the winner in this. They, they gained market share for a while and then they declined as South Korea and Taiwan became the dominant. It's not even, I shouldn't even mention the countries because really it's the companies, but I don't remember the companies, so it's easy to remember the countries. But it's the companies in these countries, the entrepreneurs in these countries, the innovators in these countries that made the appropriate progress, that changed the world. But uh, so dominance in semiconductor moved in the United States to Japan, from Japan ultimately to South Korea and Taiwan, although the United States is still a very big player in chip manufacturing. And you know who isn't a big player in chip manufacturing? China. I don't know, yesterday I, when we had the, the, uh, the interview with uh, Jim Maroney about um, happiness, we talked about motivation by fear. And notice that politicians almost always use motivation by fear. And you know they're doing something bad when that's how they're motivated. Now, uh, um, Schumer, Senator Schumer from New York, also motivated this by positive values. <laughs> Jobs in New York. So this is just, the whole thing is, it has nothing to do with national security. It has everything to do with the attempt of, uh, uh, you know, people to, to, the attempt of some politicians to centrally plan, of economists to centrally plan, to control, to subsidize, to, to penalize, to basically determine the fate of a particular market. And at the same time, to line the pockets of politicians, providing jobs for the community, helping out the community. Okay, so not, sorry, not line the pockets of politicians, although that usually comes up as well. It's about lining up the votes for those politicians. So tell us the fact that this bill will probably weaken the US economy, tell us the fact that this bill might actually uh, reduce American competitiveness, American company competitiveness in the semiconductor industry. It doesn't matter because the senators are going to get more votes because they can inspire people because at the superficial level, at the level of, you know, economics, in economics in one lesson, Hasler talks about the fact that what's interesting about economics, what's important about economics, what matters about economics are not the first level effects, but the second, third, fourth level effects. The first level effect of the government subsidizing an industry is more jobs in that industry. Yay. But what are the second, third, fourth level effects? They're never positive in this kind of scenario. And they always way outweigh the negative, the, the, sorry, the positives, the, the increased jobs. So, for example, you're sucking money out of other parts of the economy in order to subsidize this. Who said this is where the money should be flowing? It obviously isn't. You're subsidizing companies that are not doing well. Ultimately, that's at the expense of companies that are doing well. You're giving competitive firepower to companies that don't have them maybe in them anymore. You're distorting, perverting the marketplace. You're shifting people's jobs. You're taking power away from, let's say, a Taiwanese or, or a Korean company that's innovative and power, and you're giving market share to a company like Intel that's not doing that well. S the national security issues can be dealt with easily without having to spend 50, it's more than 50 billion. That's just part of the bill. That's just the direct subsidies, but there are also parts of it that are going to uh, grants the National Science Foundation to give out for research and this money to universities and you know in other words a huge push into semiconductor research in the United States at universities and other levels massive amounts of waste massive amounts of again just just spending the money where it doesn't need to be spent spending and yeah positive results might come of it but What's the cost? What's the net cost? The net value? 
Thank you, uh, Jack. I appreciate the $20 value for value. I, I appreciate that. So the CHIPS Act, which Republicans are hailing and Democrats are hailing and everybody is excited about, everybody's kumbaya and everybody is great, not good for the US economy, not good for chip manufacturers, not good for technology you know, uh, uh, long term. Indeed, one of the reasons given, I've read a number of articles on this, one of the reasons given for the fact that the Chinese are behind, behind, in chip manufacturing, chip development, is the fact that it's subsidized and controlled and manipulated and centrally planned. That's how you kill an economy. That's how you kill an industry. What we want is to unleash the creative juices of people, productive people in this country. To do that, what you need is to get the government out of the way, not to give the government a giant pot of money and to tell it to go pick the winners and losers and to make investments and to, and to plan, plan our futures for us all. All right. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see The Iran Brooks Show grow, please consider sharing our content, and of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.